Hi, thanks for joining me. I'm Angela Rasmussen at the Center for Infection and Immunity at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. I'm a virologist who studies the host response to viral infection. Today, I'm going to be talking about how I do that um, and what those host responses to virus infection are and what they can tell us. Before I get started, I always like to um, do a territorial acknowledgement and equity statement that today I'm presenting from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Duwamish people. Much of the analytical work presented today was performed on the traditional lands of both the Duwamish people and the Lenape people. And I honor and acknowledge these first people of these territories, as well as their tribal governments, histories and ancestry, and their roles today in caring for these lands. And I'd also like to acknowledge the history of systemic inequity in academic science that has spanned decades and even centuries. Columbia University was founded using profits from the transatlantic slave trade, which has left a very long and painful legacy of racial and gender-based inequities that continue to this day in academic research and medicine. And I encourage all of you watching this presentation to consider how you can contribute to making scientific research a more equitable enterprise. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the host response to viral infection, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the systems biology approach that I use to study this topic. And this is really an iterative process um, in which I take experimental data from experimental models in the lab, doing traditional virology, biochemistry, and bench science, and this can be in either cell culture or animals, and applying that um, to various omics techniques. So these are methods of looking at the entire global host response to infection, either by looking at the transcriptome, measuring gene expression, or by looking at the proteome or metabolome uh, using mass spectrometry. I take these large data sets and I apply them to computational models, um, bioinformatic methods of trying to sift through all of this data and find out what's most important of it. From that, I can get some clues to some translational applications, either biomarker panels that can be used to diagnose disease or predict outcome, novel host-directed drug targets, as well as correlates of protection for vaccines. Then I can use the same models and the same approach to test these over again. So this combination of multiple experimental systems has been very useful to answer complex questions, such as those involving the host response that involve a lot of different key players in the host uh, in terms of determining either pathogenicity, that's uh, severity of disease or protection. So one thing that's important to understand about pathogenesis is there's really two sides to it. On one side, we have the virus and viruses are, they're not simple, but they're relatively um, simple compared to human hosts. So they have smaller genomes that encode fewer genes. Uh, in this case, we're looking at Ebola virus. Um, these genes encode multifunctional proteins. The human host, by contrast, uh, has a much larger genome size, so 3.2 billion base pairs that encode roughly 20,000 different genes. And these genes are not only multifunctional proteins, but they can be expressed as multiple isoforms, and they're organized into specialized pathways. So there's this really complica complicated interplay between a host and its pathogen that often determines how severe disease can be. And we know from prior experiments that these host responses are linked to pathogenicity or the ability of a virus to cause disease. On the left here in this heat map, we're looking at some of the immune and inflammatory genes that are expressed when infected with a seasonal influenza virus isolate. Um, that's the Texas panel uh, compared to a highly pathogenic avian influenza isolate. That's the H5N1 uh, Vietnam 1203 strain on the right. And as you can see, Red uh, on this map shows genes that are incredibly upregulated. You can see that all of these inflammatory genes are dramatically upregulated compared in the H5N1 compared to the seasonal influenza virus. So we know that these different host responses are associated with viruses that cause disease of different severity. We see the same thing in the heat map on the right, looking at responses between Ebola virus, which causes very severe disease in people versus Rustin virus, which is another type of Ebola virus that doesn't cause disease in people at all. And again, we see very different characteristics of the host response to these two viruses. So we know that these, are, these host responses are linked to disease severity. So how do we study that? One way of doing this is by looking at animal models of pathogenesis. 
So many people like different types of animal models and they all have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. On the left, we have the inbred laboratory mouse, which has been a mainstay of scientific research for the last 50 years. These animals are genotyped. Um, we know their genomes. We know what all of their genes are. We know what they do. They're highly homozygous, meaning they're not very genetically diverse, which means that they're very reproducible. There are many reagents available for interrogating their immune systems. They're small and easy to handle, and they're also affordable. The downside to this model is that they're not very genetically diverse, which is very different from humans. They're also genetically distant from humans. They're not closely related to us evolutionarily. There's poor correlation with host response data um, in humans when you look at uh, host response data for mice. And it often requires a human pathogen to be adapted to replicate efficiently in mice. So you actually have to use different viruses in many cases. On the right, we have non-human primates. Uh, most commonly, the rhesus macaque is used to study virus pathogenesis. These are genetically much closer to humans and they're highly genetically diverse. Um, they're also susceptible to infection with wild type human pathogens in many cases, but this advantage is that they're not genotyped, they're exposed. Um, there's limited reagents to look at their immune systems, and they're also much larger, which can be a problem when you're working with highly pathogenic viruses that require higher levels of biocontainment. Furthermore, in 2013, a study was done that showed that uh, host response data from mice, from C57 black six mice, did not replicate or did not correlate, at least, with host response data from human diseases for a number of different inflammatory conditions including infection. So for this reason, people thought that, that mice may not be the best model for looking at host responses. And mouse-adapted Ebola virus, um, there is a mouse model for Ebola and it uses a mouse-adapted virus, is of limited utility in these lab mice. So when you infect lab mice with wild-type uh, Ebola, in this case, the Myinga strain, which is the prototypic strain of Ebola, there is some virus replication, but it doesn't cause disease and it doesn't kill the animals. When you use the mouse adapted virus, it does kill the animals. However, the disease is not very similar to what you see in human Ebola virus disease. So we wanted to know if increased host genetic diversity would result in an expanded range of these host responses and allow us to better model this disease and, pathogenesis and its pathogenesis. So we began using the collaborative cross mouse systems genetics model. This model uh, incorporates over 90% of the genetic diversity across the entire mus muscula species, and that's compared with conventional inbred laboratory mice, which only encompass about 11% of that genetic diversity. This is a panel of mice that are generated through this funnel breeding scheme that's uh, the result of crossing eight different mouse genetic backgrounds together. Five of these are conventional laboratory mice, and three of them are wild mice derived. After this, this breeding scheme, uh, these multiple funnels will result in a panel of mice that are re, uh, reproducible and inbred, but are genetically distinct from one another and have expanded genetic diversity. We decided to try to model Ebola virus disease using this model. So modeling Ebola virus disease is very complicated. Um, Ebola virus infects a number of different cell types and it has effects on other cell types that it does not infect. So when a person is infected with Ebola virus, the first targets are monocytes and macrophages, as well as neutrophils. These, these cells will be infected, they will migrate to secondary lymphoid organs, and they will begin secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines. They will also begin secreting large amounts of virus. This causes uh, lymphocytes, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and B cells in those secondary lymphoid organs to undergo bystander apoptosis, at the same time, the viremia that results from all of this virus secretion causes the hepatocytes in the liver to become infected, causing those cells to die and depleting uh, the blood of clotting factors. The pro-inflammatory cytokines that are secreted into the bloodstream cause disseminated intravascular, co intravascular coagulation to occur, and this results in uh, the coagulopathy and prolonged coagulation and vascular leakage that is characteristic of hemorrhagic Ebola virus disease. So this is a complex disease that requires multiple cell types uh, to model pathogenesis. So you need to have a model that is going to uh, encapsulate all of these different complex factors. And what we saw when we infected collaborative cross mice with mouse-adapted Ebola virus is that we saw a dependency of severity 
by genetic background. So we saw some mice that had an expanded range of disease phenotypes or presentations. In some mice, they died, uh, similar to what conventional laboratory mice do. Some mice died with evidence of hemorrhagic syndrome, and some mice were what we call tolerant, which means that they were infected with the virus. They had a relatively mild course of disease from which they fully recovered. You can see the differences here in this, uh, in this slide. On the left, we have survival and morbidity data as measured by weight loss. You see that all of the lethal hemorrhagic syndrome lines uh, died by day six post-infection. Um, both lines lost weight uh, at the same rate, but you can see that the tolerant animals shown in blue recovered uh, after 14 days. You also see that in the animal that was susceptible to lethal disease with hemorrhagic syndrome, uh, that there was prolonged clotting times as well as reduced serum fibrinogen. And both of these animals had virus replicating in the liver. This is an immunohistochemistry slide showing VP40, which is a viral protein. In the animal with lethal disease, there was significantly more virus than in the tolerant animal. So as I mentioned, we can see a spectrum of different Ebola virus disease phenotypes in the collaborative cross. And both in CC lines and CC Rix lines, which are a cross between two collaborative cross lines, we see about a third of the animals are tolerant, a third of them have lethal disease with no hemorrhagic syndrome, and a third of them have lethal disease with hemorrhagic syndrome in the 75 lines that we've looked at so far. So this model is definitely better and it's an improvement upon the existing inbred animal model, in, inbred mouse models for studying Ebola virus disease. Next, um, we're comparing tolerance versus susceptibility. So this is how does the host response differ in tolerant animals versus susceptible ones? Um, this is a really important question since, as I mentioned before, the host response can determine disease severity. So we know that tolerant animals are infected, as I mentioned before as well, but they restrict production of infectious virus, and that's what this slide shows. So we see that uh, both in the spleen and liver, which are susceptible organs to Ebola virus infection, we see increases in viral RNA. There are only significant differences, however, in, uh, in when you look at infectious virus by focus-forming assay, which looks at virus that is actually capable of infecting and replicating in cells. Um, we see that the lethal animals um, have significantly more infectious virus uh, that is being produced in both organs compared to the tolerant animals. So again, this suggests that while virus, in, virus infection is part of the story, it's not the entire story. Um, there's still probably host-specific differences that are determining uh, the difference in outcome. So we looked at the transcriptomes of these animals. This is looking at gene expression across the entire genome over time after infection in four lethal uh, collaborative cross lines compared to six tolerant collaborative cross lines. And what we saw is that lethal outcomes are associated with very early suppression of the host response in general. As you can see on both of these heat maps for the spleen on the left and the liver on the right, there is a big gray stripe uh, on the lethal side of things at, at day one post-infection. And that really shows that all of these host responses are, are inhibited um, or they're just really not, the host isn't responding to infection early on. Whereas in the tolerant animals at day one, you do see uh, either blue for inhibition or red for upregulation of many of these different host pathways. And if you look at the slide closely, you can see that many of these pathways are involved in immune and inflammatory responses, suggesting that tolerance is associated with a very early immune response to virus infection. We looked more closely at functional enrichment, and we saw that early suppression of host immunity does drive this tolerant phenotype or lethal phenotype. Again, you can see at day three post-infection, and this is a, a combination of the, the genes that are expressed as well as microRNAs, which regulate those genes being expressed, that there's a profound suppression of um, immune and inflammatory responses in lethal animals at day three compared to tolerant animals, in which many of these are upregulated. Key thing to note is that many of these things at later time points are actually downregulated in tolerant animals, which suggests that while lethal animals have no early uh, 
response, the early response in tolerant animals allows them to better regulate these responses. It's thought that severe Ebola virus disease is caused by unregulated expression of these innate immune and inflammatory factors that cause a systemic inflammatory condition to occur. In the tolerant animals, those early responses allow that response to be controlled, whereas in the lethal case, uh, those controls are completely removed. And so there's later up complete um, unregulated upregulation of inflammation, um, which causes disease. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about how we can use these host responses to predict disease outcome. So we already know which, which of these host responses are associated with either tolerance or lethality. Is there any way that we could use this information to predict outcome, including in patients? And the way we decided to approach this was using a machine learning approach called random forests. Random forests are a binary decision tree method of classification that allows you to take gene profiles and, and uh, build a model that can discriminate on either a lethal or a tolerant outcome using those gene pr expression profiles. When we did this random forest method with a, a profile of about 14 genes from spleen or liver and collaborative cross mice, we got extremely high accuracy of classification, meaning that we were able to predict 99.9% .9 of times uh, the correct outcome in using data from the spleen and correctly 99.6% of times uh, in the liver. And these were done by rerunning this over a thousand times to, uh, to see how many times we could get it right. So how does the classifier trained in mice compare to patient data? This is the really relevant question if we want to try to apply our findings from the collaborative cross mouse model uh, to human Ebola virus disease patients. We were able to obtain sequence uh, transcriptomic data from Ebola virus disease patients from West Africa. Uh, this study used a similar approach, um, random forests and another machine learning algorithm called support vector machines to also do similar predictions. And they were able to classify outcome correctly 79 to 85% of the time. We wanted to know if we could take the genes that we had identified in mice, apply it to the patients and see similar prediction performance. We were able to accurately predict the outcome in both the mouse and the human data sets. So on the left, uh, this is a receiver operating characteristic curve uh, that shows um, the accuracy of this classification approach. On the left, we have the human data um, used to predict outcome in the mice. We were able to predict correctly the outcome in the mice 90.5% of the time, that's what that AUC number indicates. That's the area under the curve. Um, on the right, we have the mouse, the mouse trained classifier uh, tested on the Ebola virus disease human patient set. And in this case, we were able to predict outcome correctly 75% of the time. It's still not as robust as in the mice. Um, however, it's similar to what they found using the human data alone to predict outcome using the human data set, which indicates that this approach is promising. We then uh, took this data and we enhanced this by developing a classifier using Ebola data from non-human primates. This was a non-human primate model of the Makona Ebola isolate that caused the West African epidemic. Once we added the non-human primate data to our model, we were able to predict outcome correctly 95.6% of the time. Again, showing that with additional data from multiple models, um, despite the complexity of the host response, we were able to uh, correctly predict outcome in a majority of patients using this method. This strongly suggests that we may be able to apply um, data that we learn we might be able to apply findings about the host response obtained from animal models to accurately predict uh, human disease, which uh, has applications for both diagnostics and prognostics. So there are other um, zoonotic pathogens that are being modeled in the collaborative cross um, that produce similarly diverse phenotypes. 
So this has broader applications beyond just Ebola virus disease. Here we have uh, data from four different pathogens. On the upper left, um, we have a strain of influenza called PR8 that causes disease in mice and is used to model influenza virus disease uh, in, in mouse models. And we see here a distribution of different disease phenotypes um, regarding weight loss and airway inflammation across multiple con collaborative cross-genetic backgrounds. On the right, we have SARS coronavirus. We, again, we see a similar distribution of different disease phenotypes. On the lower left, uh, we see West Nile virus, which causes um, both a tolerant phenotype, it causes acute disease in collaborative cross backgrounds, and it also can cause a chronic or persistent infection in these backgrounds, again, simulating uh, the, the spread of different disease presentations that we see with West Nile virus infection in people. And on the lower right, we have Tyler's murine encephalitis virus, which is a mouse virus um, that is often used to model uh, neurotropic virus infection. And again, we see a different a spread of different phenotypes um, that are based on collaborative cross genetic background. So this may be very useful for studying other emerging viruses. Um, here I have some data that is actually unpublished um, that was generated for a grant application that shows that we see a similar spread of lethality and tolerance as well as partial tolerance um, in collaborative cross mice that are infected with both uh, H1N1, the 1918 pandemic strain, as well as the highly pathogenic Vietnam 1203 isolate of H5N1 avian influenza. Um, again, we are seeing this, this broader spread of uh, different phenotypes in this genetically diverse mouse model, suggesting that it might be good for, for modeling the various types of host responses that we see in people. We've also obtained similar data modeling different dengue virus outcomes uh, in the collaborative cross. So this really suggests that this model may be very good and very useful for understanding uh, emerging viruses that we don't have very much information on with regards to the host response, and that it can faithfully replicate many different disease presentations that we see in humans. And this is an ongoing active area of research. So there are a number of host response questions that we can address using the collaborative cross model, including applications to SARS coronavirus 2, which I'm going to end by speaking briefly about. We can map genes associated with disease severity because the collaborative cross is fully sequenced and we know all of the genomic differences for the various collaborative cross lines that are available. This model is excellent for linking genes statistically to various complex traits or phenotypes to different disease presentations. Um, we can also more closely investigate the role of non-coding RNA in the host response, which is something that is really poorly understood currently. We can also look at the gene uh, expression responses in individual cell types um, from different tissues so that we can start looking at cell type specific host responses. We can investigate mechanisms of pathogenesis once these models have been established. We can do transmission or infection route studies uh, to understand how susceptible an animal or a person would be by a given infection route. Um, we can look at persistence, which is something that is an open question for SARS coronavirus 2. It's something that has only been appreciated for many other acute viral infections such as Ebola in recent years when there's been evidence of persistence in human patients. And finally, we can use these models to test novel drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics, um, something that, again, is of critical importance given the ongoing SARS coronavirus to COVID-19 pandemic. So as promised, I'm going to end by speaking briefly about some efforts that I have planned with collaborators to model SARS coronavirus 2 in the collaborative cross model. So one thing that's important to note is that SARS coronavirus 2, the wild type virus, cannot use mouse ACE2 as a receptor. ACE2 is the molecule that the virus has to bind in order to enter the cell and cause an infection. There are transgenic mice that express the human ACE2 receptor, um, and they can be infected, but they do not develop severe disease, or at least they develop severe disease uh, in a background dependent model. That suggests that a genetically diverse model, such as the collaborative cross, might actually be much more appropriate. 
Now, ACE2, human ACE2, is located on the X chromosome. This is important because human ACE2 transgenic mice are what are called Nokian mice. That means that ACE2, the human ACE2 transgene has been inserted and replaces the mouse gene for ACE2 that's on the X chromosome. This also means that if you crossed a collaborative cross mouse with an, a human ACE2 transgenic Nokian mouse, all of the offspring would be able to express eight ACE2 because they all have an X chromosome. So we are planning to make what are called F1 human ACE2 transgenic collaborative cross mice. This is where we take a female uh, ACE2 transgenic mouse, which will have a copy of the human ACE2 on each X chromosome, and we cross these with male uh, collaborative cross mice. Those offspring will both have the genetic diversity present in the collaborative cross and will also express human ACE2, thus rendering them susceptible to SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Our plan is to use this model to look at the diverse array of host responses in different genetic backgrounds and determine how this relates to disease pathogenesis and COVID-19 severity. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge my many collaborators without whom this work would not have been possible, as well as my funding sponsors. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that are sent to me after this talk. Thank you so much for your time and attention.